Hello everyone, I am Edo, and uh, thanks for tuning into the video here. Um, hope you're having a productive lockdown, so to speak. I hope your state might get to some semblance of normalcy here soon. My state hasn't been as mm, hard about uh, getting out and whatnot as some other states are, but uh, hopefully the world will get back to normal here pretty soon. Um, but uh, during the lockdown here, I was watching a lot of videos, you know, specifically on YouTube for a couple of different projects, just for my own entertainment's sake. And one of the things that I started watching videos on was uh, homemade trading card games. I did not know that there's a homemade trading card game community out there until just around the lockdown started. Now, I'd always uh thought about making my own trading card game i would write down some notes and cards and rule type of things think about it every now and then but uh, ever since the lockdown started i've been thinking more and more about actually putting it into motion now for me here uh, what i did was that i pretty much have all of my rules set in stone here and i've been designing some cards and and uh, I need to finalize what I want to include in the first set. And of course, the major uh, final hurdle there is for art. So what I decided to do is that uh, just to give back to a little bit in the homemade uh, trading card game community from the stuff that I have learned from various videos and all of that is what did I think about and what things I had to consider when I was designing my own homemade trading card game. So, uh, made up a little presentation here, video, things to watch out for and all of that. Now, one thing that I got to tell you here is that you do not have to do a single thing that I say in this video. If you already have all your rules and your cards and everything, if it's set in stone, more than likely you're not going to be able to benefit from this video. That being said, if you just started out making your rules, maybe you're halfway through it, or maybe you're just in the initial planning stages, uh, this video will probably be a little bit of a benefit to you just to keep some things in mind, uh, things to do or things to just watch out for. So what I learned from making a homemade trading card game uh, so that you can do it too. So. Why create a trading card game? Of course, everyone who has played a trading card game says, I could make one. Easy enough. Everyone's considered it at one particular point. There's nothing really wrong with that. I mean, TCGs are fun, collectible, and allow you to continually make and improve something, i.e. like a sense of growth. Almost like a real life, say, role-playing game, where when you make cards, you start out with a certain number of them and you see how the mechanics work and then you further evolve and expand the game with additional cards, additional storylines, effects, all those kinds of things like that. Now, uh, before we start to get into the real meat of what uh, this video is, uh, let's all be realistic here, is that you're not going to be able to make a living off of a homemade trading card game. It's not going to happen. Unless there's something really, 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 really spectacular in your game, uh, you're not going to be able to make a living off of it. Now, I've been working on this presentation to put as part of the video here for, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks. Two, two and a half, three weeks here. And coincidentally, I think it was last week that Zach from the Chaos Galaxy, and if you're not familiar with the Chaos Galaxy, it's one of the more prominent homemade trading card games that you can see on YouTube. He posted a video about how much can you make from a trading card game, or more specifically, a homemade trading card game. And he went into it, he gave us all of the concrete figures. Now, the long and the short of it is, he makes roughly $100 a month off of his trading card game, and roughly $100 a month off of YouTube views. Once again, that depends on sales, of course, on the trading card game end, and then the views that he gets from YouTube. Um, so he makes roughly about $200 a month, and I'm pretty sure you're aware that that's not enough to make a living on. So what I want you to do is, if you're going to be creating your own homemade trading card game, I want you to be realistic about your expectations of what it's going to be. So what you need to do is, and as Zach stated in his own video, is that you do it as a hobby because you enjoy it. 
He enjoys trading card games and he enjoys drawing. And I believe maybe his major in college is some sort of art related one. I'm not 100% sure, so don't quote me on that. But he does it because he enjoys it. And you know what? I think a lot of people who would get involved in making a trading card game would also enjoy it. But the other realistic thing that I want you to think about is that it also takes a lot of time and dedication. We'll go over a couple of those different things when we get into the rest of the presentation here. So, I mean, it's easy to create a trading card game, specifically a homemade trading card game. And what I'll do is when I say TCG in here, you have to use a little bit of mental gymnastics to say what it, uh, refer to what I'm either talking about a homemade trading card game or one that's already been released. If it's something that's already been released, generally TCG will refer to that. But uh, in other kinds of elements, when I talk about your TCG, it's going to refer to a homemade one. Now, once again, it's very easy because you've got a lot of different sites that can do things. Uh, prominently, right now, the Game Crafter, even though it's on lockdown, of course, uh, they do things like printing up their own cards. You can do booster packs, booster boxes, starter decks, um, rule books. You can put components and dice and all sorts of stuff into your game. So it's actually pretty darn easy. Now, on uh, using Game Crafter, I've, I've only put up a prototype of a card game that I uh, eventually need to finish up, a non-collectible game, and it, it's actually pretty good. The card quality and all of that is really, really nice. If you've purchased some items through the Game Crafter, you probably have already seen the type of quality that it can do. Uh, in addition to that, there is an actual homemade TCG community where lots of different people uh, uh, on YouTube uh, I believe there's, yeah, there's a Discord channel where they'll put up their own games. Um, maybe it's just someone who's gotten pieces of paper and they've drawn their own cards or things of that particular nature, which is absolutely fine. But the purpose of this particular uh, video is going to be, okay, if you're going to be doing rules, that's fine. But if you're going to try and branch out, in other words, actually release a TCG, what I want you to do is keep these things in mind that I'll be talking about. Here, what I want to do is I want to give you some full disclosure about what my TCG experience has been over the past uh, 20 plus years. Uh, one of the things i got to tell you is that I'm just a player. I don't have any real experience in the industry on the design or production end, but I do have a lot in the community and playtesting end. That does not make me an expert. It does not make me a foremost leader. Uh, I'm not trying to puff myself up to saying you need to listen to what I have to say. It's I just want to let you know that I do have I do have an, a bit of involvement in the community and playtesting end. I played a lot of TCGs in my time, of course. Uh, the major one that I played was Magic the Gathering, but then started doing things like Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, Force of Will, and Transformers are some of the current ones. I have played a number of different TCGs in both the US and Japan, and of course that uh, playing in Japan, mainly that was Yu-Gi-Oh, but every now and then played a couple other games, kind of like uh, Duel Masters and some lesser known ones. Uh, current ones that I uh, have played would, would have been Zombie World Order, uh, one of the few games I was actually good at, but it, the game itself folded. Um, but uh, Transformers is one that I found that I'm, not to toot my own horn, but I feel that I'm better at it than some other games. Um, I was a contracted writer for the now defunct Inquest magazine, as well as Wizard World magazine. For Inquest, I did some stuff about uh, deck building for Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, there's uh, two schools of thought whether those articles are good or not. Uh, but for Wizard World magazine, I did some uh, little bit articles on Japanese trading card games while I was living on over there. I would buy one, do a couple of scans, do whatever, just do a write-up, read the rules, play it once or twice, and uh, give some individuals overseas the ability to see what what kind of games there were available in Japan. Um, I also did work for Pojo's Pokemon Magazine and some po and some other Pojo Magazine specials. Did some Pokemon stuff, of course. Like I said, they're mainly translations. And uh, one of the major Pojo ones was uh, they did a Dual Master special where I did the history of Dual Masters from the uh, comic at the time up to that point. Uh, what I used to do is that uh, I used to do a lot of fan translations of Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh cards. So that's what I was known for on the community end. Tell you the truth, 
I'm not very good at trading card games, but I was involved in those two particular communities. Because of my work in the community in the Pokemon trading card game many years ago when I was living in Hawaii, I was able to attend three of the world championships that were held there. Not as a player, but as a member go around and I did, I did uh, uh, an article for my website those things like that and got to talk to a bunch of different people got to know some people in the industry like at Wizards of the Coast uh, many of them who have moved on but a couple of uh, Japanese staff as well and I was surprised that uh, because I had done this kind of work some of the Japanese staff actually knew who I was which was really nice um, and lastly here I actually did some official play testing for an older trading card game it's called Imagination Duel uh, uh, originally it was a trading card game and they wanted to make it uh, sort of an IP uh, so they did I believe there was an animated series out for a while but that was cancelled and I think there were a couple of Game Boy games one two they weren't trading card games but uh, they broadened what the story and of of that particular game was and the world and all of that so that set was called Awakening uh, mainly I did uh, I concentrate a lot on the core there was a faction in there so this is all just to give you a little background of my involvement there's a long sordid history a lot of details mainly the bad ones that i won't go over but <clears throat> pardon me this is what you see here about what kind of stuff that i have done over the time of playing tcgs okay now have you heard of some of these tcgs um have you played them have you heard about them uh, some of these are old ones, some of these are new ones, like Aliens Predator, Anime Mayhem, Anime Madness, Duel Masters, and its more recent uh, incarnation, Kaijudo. There's Gundam MS War, Eborian Gates, Initial D, Legend of the Five Rings, Middle Earth The Wizards, Redemption, Sailor Moon, Star Trek, the Decipher version, Star Wars, both the Decipher and Wizards of the Coast versions, Tempest of the Gods, The Crow, Terminator, Tomb Raider, Ultimate Combat, World of Warcraft, Wyvern, uh, Zatch Bell, but also called Gash Bell in Japan, and of course, Zombie World Order. How many of those ha have you ever heard about? How many of them have you actually played? All of these I have played at least at one point for either a very short time or an extended period of time. So, uh, one of the first things you want to do is you want to start a with the rules of the game. Yes, it's very tempting to, to jump in. I want to create a bunch of cards with this cool character, these cool effects and everything like that. Well, without the rules, you don't know how the cards are actually going to work. So, obviously this is the most important framework that, you're going, that your players are going to use to basically navigate your game. In other words, to play the game, but also determines uh, the cards you'll be making and how they break those rules. Most trading cards... Uh, most cards in a trading card game, pardon me, uh, break the rules on a regular basis. I mean, most of the times when you crack open a rule book, it'll say the first golden rule is that when a card contradicts the rules, the card takes precedence. Sometimes there are some exceptions to those rules, uh, but those are few and far in between. But what you want to do is that you're going to think about how your cards work within the function of the rules that you're making basic cards and then some cards with special effects that break the rules turn them on their head kind of thing like that so when you're making your game there's nothing wrong with taking mechanics from other tcgs and uh, making them part of your game because after all if it's a published tcg it's been played a lot some of the rules probably work and you might want to adapt some of those rules into your game i mean what you want to avoid doing, of course, is directly copying a game system and just reskinning it for your own, which can lead to possible legal issues. Um, in other words, you don't want to take Magic the Gathering, reskin it with your own cards and whatnot, and then just put it out there. If it's too similar, uh, they will probably have some problems with that. Uh, I have uh, indexed here Wizards of the Coast versus Cryptozoic Entertainment. Uh, Cryptozoic Entertainment uh, currently runs an online trading card game, a digital trading card game called Hex. And uh, Wizards of the Coast felt that it was a little too similar to their Magic uh, the Gathering online game. To the point where, well, I believe the lawsuit was that they uh, inf 
it s was similar enough that people couldn't tell the difference and uh cryptozoic entertainment had to pay an undisclosed sum and of course the game the game is still out and everything like that so uh, what you want to do is once again avoid exactly copying a system take the th parts of the various games that you like and then try and put them together if something doesn't work tweak it modify or completely remove it or replace it with another rule that does work so some things that you need to keep in mind with your rules some things to when you're designing your rules think about these wind conditions your deck size composition and your hand sizes uh, your resource system if you're going to have one how the turns of the game flow and of course your combat system generally combat is uh, something that every game has unless you're running a very uh, untraditional trading card game but you want to see how those combat rules work now Let's start with win conditions here. How are your players going to win the game? In Magic the Gathering, you reduce your opponent's life to zero. That's the foremost win condition. Yes, if you've played Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh! and some other games, there are some other conditions in which they can win the game. But first and foremost, that is the way to win the game. Now, we can divide these basic win conditions into about five different systems that I have down here. There are probably a couple more, but these are the most prominent ones. It's going to be a life system. There's going to be a shield system, a damage stack system, a deck out system, and some alternate win conditions. Now, your game is not going to use all of these. Uh, you may use one or two, but these are the foremost the types of win systems that you're going to be encountering in a lot of the games that you play. Now, starting with the life system, uh, basically you have a starting life value, and when your life is reduced to zero, you lose the game. You're, so in other words, your whole goal is to make sure that you stay above zero and you reduce all your opponent's values to zero. Generally, games that use this are Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Force of Will, Buddy Fight, Zombie World Order, and even Wrath of Cores, which is one of the homemade trading card games. My personal opinion is that this is the most balanced system and the threat level of a creature is based on how much damage it can actually do. So in a life system, uh, a creature that doesn't do a lot of damage, um, its threat level is relatively low. The more damage it does, the higher its threat level. Of course, this is ignoring some effects that may go along with some uh, small but powerful creatures. Um, but right now, what I just want you to keep in mind is that basic representation of threat level based on how much damage it can do. Now what we do is uh, uh, talk about Legend of the Five Rings used an expanded version of the life system called Honor. Technically you could put this under the point system, but since there is a predetermined value that could cause you to lose the game, I've included in this particular point. Uh, card effects, you know, recruiting certain characters and destroying enemies in Legend of the Five Rings gave you more honor. If you started your turn with 40 honor, you won the game. This was a core mechanic of the game. However, if your honor was ever reduced to minus 20 or below, you would be removed from the game. And another variant of the life system was used uh, by a game called Anime Madness. Um, this game never really got off the ground apart from some starter decks. And as a matter of fact, when the game came out, I actually communicated with the designer at the time. Now, Anime Madness was was basically a reskinned Magic the Gathering. It had some tweaks to it, but for all intents and purposes, it was Magic the Gathering, but uh, there was no uh, colored mana in there. It was all colorless. But in Anime Madness, uh, each player who started the game with 20 life. And in, I believe in Anime Madness, it was called Ratings Points. Uh, because what you were doing is that the players were playing the... Uh, were playing as animation corporations, you know, television stations, kind of thing like that. So, if you reduced your opponent's uh, life to zero, or the ratings points to zero, uh, or you, they would lose the game. And so if you reduced everyone else's uh, life points to zero, you were, uh, I believe it was like, I'm trying to quote the rules here that you'd become the only thing on television. But if you increased your life to 40, you also won the game, i.e. being the coolest thing on television. Interesting concept on the life system. But also don't forget the complete opposite of the point system. 
uh, the opposite of the life system is going to be a point system, pardon me. Instead of reducing an opponent's value to zero, uh, you can have mechanics that cause a player to gain points and when they return, get to a certain value, then they then you win the game. Uh, games that use this uh, system are Doom Trooper, uh, of course Chaos Galaxy, another homemade trading card game, and the Middle Earth the Wizards used something similar. Overall, the entire game was a bit different than your normal uh, TCG but uh, once you were, got to a predetermined point, you would count up things called marshalling points. And whoever had the most at the end of the game won. Of course, there were some other alternate win conditions in that game. Now we have something called a shield system. And in the shield system, players at the start of the game get a predetermined number of cards they put aside. And as attacks are received, uh, those shields are broken and usually put into that player's hand. Uh, usually, this, this was mainly used... Uh, and uh, Duel Masters, also Kaijudo, but there was an older game that used something very similar to it that was before Duel Masters. It was called Towers in Time. It was a very much maligned game uh, in Quest, uh, made fun of it on a regular basis. Uh, some people said it was a, kind of a deep system, but it seemed to have been a precursor to this shield system. Now, Pokemon uses a variant of the shield system. Instead of breaking your opponent's shields, you break your own shields to go into your hand um, as you defeat your opponent's creatures. And Legend of the Five Rings and Argent Saga uses another modified version of the shield system where uh, provinces or areas of play are attacked. So in other words, you'll attack your opponent's certain locations and when all are destroyed uh, or, or perhaps get one extra attack in there, then that player loses the game. <clears throat> now the main pros and cons of the system are is that on the pro side, uh, it doesn't require any bookkeeping for any life. You don't have to use, say, a notebook. You don't have to use a calculator or anything like that. The con is that even small resource light creatures can be dangerous. And um, if you're familiar with swarm decks or beatdown decks, those particular uh, kinds of strategies can be kind of dangerous in a shield-based system. <clears throat> Pardon me. The other thing is a damage stack system. In a damage stack system, when a player is hit by a creature, they usually take the top card of the deck and place it in a special stack of cards. Once a player has a predetermined number of them uh, in that stack, then that player loses the game. Uh, you can mainly see this in currently in TCGs in Cardfight Vanguard and Final Fantasy. And it's sort of similar to the shield system. It does have the same pros and cons where it doesn't require bookkeeping, but even small creatures can be quite dangerous. Another one that you don't see too much of here is something called a deck out system. When an opponent is hit with attacks, you know, your opponent discards cards from the top of their deck, usually related to their power or something like that. You know, if your opponent's deck is reduced to zero cards, then you win. Uh, you were able to see this early on in uh, the Decipher version of the Star Wars um, training card game, uh, Wizards of the Coast Arc System. And if you're not familiar with that, it was basically a Magic the Gathering light system. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, if you even recall that game being released, and uh, Gundam War, both in the U.S. version and the Japanese version. Now, once again, the pro is that you don't have to do any bookkeeping. Uh, the con is that as you take damage, your options are severely reduced, preventing you from playing the game. Personally, I like the way a deck out system looks, and it's sort of uh, gratifying to see you know cards discard from the top of your opponent's deck, but I could see that if you're trying to build a particular strategy around a certain number of cards, by simple bad luck, you could lose the cards before you get to it, and then there goes your entire strategy. So be careful about thinking about this, and we'll talk about number of cards in a deck uh, later in the video here. But if you like the system, make sure that you give players the option to be able to play the deck that they want to play. Now, we talked about some basic win conditions that are fundamental core parts of your game, but what about some alternate win conditions? Some of them could be in your core rules, some of them could be introduced by other cards, because once again, like we talked about, trading card games are made to break the rules, and in this case, add additional rules. Now, think about some alternate win conditions. Do you have any? In other words, are there any other ways to win other than the systems that we just described? Shield, life, whatever it may be. Now, one thing to consider is what happens when a player runs out of cards in their deck. 
and many games running out of cards in your deck. If you have no cards in your deck and you need to draw a card uh, and you can't, then you lose the game. Do they? Does that happen in your game? Do they lose at that particular time? Or is the deck reshuffled and they get to keep playing? Um, or do they uh, continue and the game just simply, they just don't get to draw any more cards whenever a rule or effect says so. What you want to do is you want to consider an alternate win condition. Pardon me, there is some sort of small insect flying around. Um, consider an alternate win condition because this prevents a, a stalemate in the game. This is why uh, in a number of different games that when your deck is empty, then you lose. Because this prevents an actual stalemate from happening. Once, In other words, it sort of functions as a time limit. So if the main way to win the game doesn't work you have something else that is like a catch-22 now when you talk about alternate win conditions say everyone knows about Yu-Gi-Oh's Exodia cards where you get five all five parts in your hand you win easy enough uh, they also have another win condition which is uh, the destiny board or called the Ouija board in Japan where if you got five particular cards in play then you also won those are not core fundamental rules but those are things that are added to the game by the cards themselves Legend of the Five Rings had two additional win conditions. One of them was a core one. One was added with other cards. Uh, so in Legend of the Five Rings, they added five cards uh, called Elemental Rings. Once you got all five of them in play, then you won. And a lot of times the, the conditions for playing these cards uh, could be difficult. And of course, there was a certain faction based on trying to be able to do this as efficiently as possible. One of the versions of the Ring of the Void there, you could play it when it was the only card in your hand. And some of the other ones had their own requirements for you be, to be able to put them into play. And once again, once you got them all, you win. It was called an Enlightenment Victory. They also had something called the Black Scrolls, and this was part of the storyline of Legend of the Five Rings. And once you had so many different Black Scrolls um, attached or used, uh, once a specific event came up here, you can see on the screen called the Darkest Magics. If a player had already used or attached seven Black Scrolls, they, scrolls, they win the game at the beginning of their next turn. If a player ever uses all 12 Black Scrolls, then they win the game immediately. So what happens is that these were powerful spells within the game. They didn't win the game on their own, but based on the Black Scrolls combined with this event card, of course, you can only include one in your deck and it came up randomly, you could win the game. Now, uh, sort of a partner game spin-off to Legend of the Five Rooms was Legend of the Burning Sands, and had something called story cards that can be played when certain things happen during the game. Sort of like when I talked about those elemental rings, well, story cards, when a certain thing happened, you could play it from your hand. And all of these story cards were with a predetermined number of points. Now you can see down here a little red arrow shows you how many points it is actually worth. And when a player had five or more points, uh, based on these cards, and they won the game, called a story victory. Now, don't be afraid to include multiple win conditions in your game. Like we just talked about Legend of the Five Rings, it used a variant on the shield system, used a variant on the life system, and uh, an enlightenment victory where you had a couple of cards in play and you could win. Doesn't mean that you have to include these conditions in your core rules. They could be introduced by, you know, cards in later sets or rules additions, kind of like Magic the Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh have done. They usually haven't added additional rules to win the game, but rather cards that have been created and released have increased the number of ways you could win the game. Now, there's a balance that you have to have. Don't be afraid to include multiple win conditions, but don't include too many of them in your core rules. Because the more ways you can win the game, you know, that gives your players freedom in creating strategies in the decks they want, but it makes it harder for a player to react to those kinds of win conditions. You understand what I'm saying here? Is that there are different ways to make decks, but if your deck is only based on doing one particular thing and you have absolutely no way to counter another particular strategy, a core win strategy, it makes for very quick and aggravating games. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, deck-based numbers, what I like to call it here is, uh, when it comes to the size of decks your players will be making, um, what's the minimum and or maximum deck size? Uh, 
you'd be surprised at how often this could come into play. Um, our players are restricted to playing a deck of an exact number of cards. Some games do give you the option to um, use as many cards in your deck as you want, but there's a defined minimum. Magic the Gathering has 60, and there is no upper limit. And some other games just say you have to use exactly this number of cards, and that's it. No more, no less. <clears throat> now, if you're using a deck out system, you know, you want to really consider the number of cards that you're going to have players have in their decks. You know, in this case, you should be using an exact number of cards uh, because it creates a level ground for your players. I mean, if you're using a deck out game, you say use 60 or more cards in your deck, players are probably going to use as many cards as they possibly can to avoid losing the game early on. So, <clears throat> and that comes to how many copies of a card uh, can a player have in their deck? You know, this number, it's a bit arbitrary, honestly, and it depends on how often you want the players to get certain cards. A uh, good rule of thumb is uh, one copy of a card for every 15 card minimum that your deck must contain. So if we take Match the Gathering, once again, as an example, they have a, a minimum of uh, 60 cards in your deck. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to be ignoring any tournament uh, restricted ban lists here. You can have four uh, copies of any particular card. And of course, that also ignores core cards, but let's just go with four copies of a, any particular card. Um, so in other words, uh, basically 15, 15, 15, and 15. You now, 15 times four is going to be 60 cards, four cards in your deck. But also, if you really think about it, Magic the Gathering sort of had some uh, basis in uh, actual, you know, poker decks and everything where you had four copies of any particular card. And of course, the suits are different. Um, Yu-Gi-Oh, on the other hand, has a 40 card minimum. They can use no more than three cards. So, however, Yu-Gi-Oh also behaves more on the one in 13 and a third ratio. And this is why I said this number is a bit arbitrary. Um, I do know that uh, for homemade trading card games that uh, both Chaos Galaxy and Wrath of Cores, you can use a maximum of two cards in your deck. So it's going to be up to you uh, how much freedom, how much restriction do you want players to have in their decks. Also, don't forget to include exceptions for certain core cards, which we'll discuss a little more later. So another thing to consider is how many cards will players draw in their initial hand? This number influences a player's starting option, so you don't want to go too high. Most 60 card games, like Magic, you draw seven cards. Yu-Gi-Oh! as players draw five. If you can't really come up with a number that you'd like to do, you're saying, I don't know if I should use this or this, uh, give this a try. Start with one card. Then increase it by, every, by one card uh, for every 10 cards in your minimum deck size. So if for a 60 card deck, players would draw seven cards, you know, one then six cards for that 60 card minimum. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a bit similar where uh, you draw five you draw five cards, but you have a 40 card deck minimum. So it's one plus four for that 40 card minimum. Now, will your players be using an additional deck of different cards during the game? Some games do. They have multiple decks. Legend of the Five Rings had two decks. One for your uh, main creatures, resource generation, events, and upgrades to your provinces. And then had another one that was simply for all other cards, such as allies, equipment, spells, and actions. You quote unquote only drew from one deck every turn, but cards will be put down in front of you every turn from the other deck. So, two different decks. Uh, Force of Will and Arjun Saga use one deck for only resource generators and then a main deck for everything else. This solves the problem that Magic the Gathering has always had, which is you uh, if you don't get the resources you need, then you can't play your cards. And this has been a gripe since the very, very, very beginning beginning of the game. Some people call it getting mana screwed. Um, you know, and I, I remember that one of the terms that I used to use, oh, the one that I used to use was, uh, after you lose the game because you don't have enough of your research, look through, oh, my land are having a party in the middle of my deck. Force of Will and Arjun Saga decided they want to correct that and they had a separate deck just for resource generation. And of course, Yu-Gi-Oh! uses one deck, uh, called the Extra Deck for Special Creatures. Used to be called the fusion deck, but now you put a whole bunch of other creatures and special equipment cards in that deck, and then use a main deck for everything else in the game. Now, will your players be able to use a small collection of cards between tournament games? 
generally you don't have to worry about this if you don't really think about uh, you know a tournament level game that you're doing but if you're thinking a little bit ahead and maybe you a bunch of your friends will be playing maybe your favorite card store will stock your game I don't know but if you're thinking about a competitive tournament environment are they going to be able to have a small collection of cards not a deck but a collection of cards that they'll be able to use to swap out between games in a tournament if you're not familiar with this, uh, Match the Gathering calls it a sideboard. Yu-Gi-Oh calls it a side deck. And what this allows you to do is that if you have your deck you start the tournament with and you find out that you're weak against a certain, um, certain other strategy, but you don't want to include it in your main deck, you can have those cards in a small collection and say, oh, my player, I lost this first game because uh, this my opponent was playing this thing and I didn't really have anything to counteract it. Well, let me swap out a couple of my cards uh, from my deck into this sideboard to be able to take care of that strategy and may perhaps not lose the game again. <clears throat> now, talk about resource systems. Are you going to be using a resource system in your game? What I mean is, is in other words, you're going to be using cards or rules uh, to generate some sort of currency that players are going to be using to play cards. Perhaps not just play cards, but also play abilities. Magic the Gathering players know exactly what I'm talking about. Having some sort of resource system, you know, at least a simple one, is preferable to having players be able to play an unlimited number of cards during a single turn. I remember watching a video, I think it was a buddy fight championship, and during the very first turn, uh, one of the players took like, I think it was five to eight minutes just on his very first turn. If you really think about it, eight minutes is a long time. I might have been closer to five, but the length of time is minimum five minutes. And his opponent was just sitting there basically, you know, the equivalent of picking his nose because he couldn't do anything. And I find that uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! is similar in that particular vein, is that Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't have any core resource system. Yes, you could debate the fact about, you know, your, your tributing or sacrifice or advance, uh, you know, release rule, whatever side of the Pacific that you're on. Um, but the fact of the matter is there are no real core resources that players use to play the game. Any other use resources that are present that are used to pay costs are generally plentiful. So my opinion is you should include some sort of a resource system or at least prevent players from playing their entire deck in one turn. Now, if you do have resources, do you have multiple types of them? Like colors, or you just have one catch-all resource. For example, Magic the Gathering uses cards called lands to generate resources to pay for other cards. Basically, you have them play, you turn on its side, called tapping, produces a resource, and use it to pay for creatures, spells, enchantments, or to activate abilities, things of that nature. Uh, Force of Will. Arjun Saga and Wrath, of course, use something similar to that. In general, you can only play one of these resources per turn. Dual Masters allowed you to put any card from your hand into your mana zone upside down to act as a resource. This was one of the items that solved the, once again, getting mana screwed in Magic the Gathering. Any card that you had in your hand could be used as a resource. It's put down in your mana zone upside down and you would tap it to provide resources. World of Warcraft, uh, the trading card game, uh, allowed you to use any card in your hand face down as a resource card. You could put one, uh, just like Magic the Gathering and all these other games that have a resource card, you could play one per turn. World of Warcraft didn't have multiple colors, it just had one, but your deck was based on the faction that you were playing. For example, I'm not up into World of Warcraft, I believe it's Alliance versus Horde, isn't it? Well, those two particular deck types they had, but also later on they introduced a monster faction. And you had to include either alliance or neutral cards or horde and neutral cards or monster and neutral cards. So that way the resources you had can only be used to pay for those cards in your deck. 
Pokemon, of course, uses energy cards to power the attacks of your creatures. If you don't have enough energy, well, then you couldn't use certain attacks. Uh, an older game, The Crow, if you're familiar with that, are required to use cards from your hand to produce resources for other cards in your hand. So in other words, uh, most of the cards in The Crow had two values. As you can see here, uh, there's one in black and one in white. Uh, the one in black is your uh, attack value, and then the one in white is your defense value. Thing is that the highest number of those two on a card function as two different things. The number of resources it could provide, but also how much the card cost. So in other words, to play this particular card, Confident Crow, its cost would be three. So of course, there's no difference between those two values. So what you would do is you would take another card from your hand that had a three or more resource value and then discard it in order to play this card. Now Final Fantasy uses a resource system, uh, its cards are called backups. And what you do is that uh, when, once you tap them, or um, dull them as I believe the uh, term is in Final Fantasy, is it produces resources, crystal points. But you could also discard cards from your hand to produce resources. A backup would produce one of whatever uh, faction or color that it was, but if you discarded a card from your hand, it actually produced two something to keep in mind. Now, this doesn't really mean that you have to have cards to produce these resources themselves. You could do it via an actual rule mechanic. Doom Trooper, um, doesn't matter if you're really familiar with the game or not, but it gave you five to start out the game with. And then by taking a special rule action during your turn, you could gain another point. These resources carried over from turn to turn with no maximum. If you've ever played played or seen Hearthstone, <clears throat> basically it gives you resources equal to your whatever your current turn was. So if it's your fifth turn, you have five resources. Yes, there are ways around this to give you extra points or whatnot, but basically you have resources equal to whatever your current turn is when you start your turn. However, these resources don't carry over from turn to turn, but they do recharge whenever your next turn comes by. Um, Chaos Galaxy gives you four resources during your turn. Uh, he, uh, Zach calls these stars, um, and they're used to pay f mainly for your creatures, but some um, resource cards, some actual resource cards, I believe what it's called, uh, require them. And you can have a maximum of 20 stars. And you use, also use those to put out your battle zones and your resource zones and your creature zones. <clears throat> now, what I want you to do is consider uh, how the turns of your game go. Basically the flow of the game and what order those particular phases come in. Some things to consider are your ready phase, your draw phase, a maintenance phase, a main phase, a combat phase, and even an end phase. Not even an end phase, but you want to have an end phase where you clean up a lot of stuff that goes on. <clears throat> ready phase. So, if your game includes a mechanic where you designate that a card has been used in some way by turning it on its side, we we'll just use the term exhausting it, uh, then during this phase you are ready all of them by reorienting them. That way they can be used again, whether it be for attacks or special abilities. Of course, this phase is irrelevant if you don't have an exhaustion mechanic in your game. Uh, Magic uses the term tap, Force of Will uses rest, Final Fantasy uses dull, Arch Saga uses exhaust, Legend of the Five Rings used bow. Um, Pokemon doesn't really have a, um, a tap mechanic. Granted, certain effects may turn a card, orient them one way or the other, turn them upside down, but technically there's nothing that says, okay, I'm attacking or using this ability, I need to turn this card on its side. For example, Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't really have that as well. You can turn cards on their side to represent a defensive creature, but uh, you don't, as a core mechanic, actually exhaust any of these cards to do anything. <clears throat> now in your draw phase, this is where your players are able to draw cards from your deck. You know, basically for new options. Usually this is the phase that people look most forward to because if they don't have many options in their hand, they're looking forward to getting a card that they can actually play. So how many cards are players going to draw? It's going to be one, two, perhaps they draw until they have a certain number of cards in their hand. Most games, you draw only one card. Uh, some games, like Final Fantasy, have two. Uh, I know that the Redemption trading card game, you draw three. 
Some other games you draw until you have a certain number of cards in your hand. I know that the Sailor Moon trading card game actually had two draw phases. One at the beginning where you got one card, and then at the end where you drew until you had five cards in your hand. Uh, Vampire the Eternal Struggle, another older game. You always had a predetermined number of cards in your hand. Whenever you played a card, you always drew a card to replace it. Now, does this phase occur at the beginning of a turn or at the end? Most of the time, this is that somewhere at the beginning of the turn where you play your cards. Legend of the Five Rings actually had it at the end of the turn after you purchase cards that you have out in front of you in your provinces. <clears throat> And like I said with uh, Sailor Moon, there were actually two of them, one at the beginning and then one at the end. Now, here's a maintenance phase. This is where players will usually do a couple of effects, usually to maintain cards that they have in play, some sort of maintenance cost. Uh, Magic the Gathering Yu-Gi-Oh! says, hey, during your whatever it is phase, do this or destroy this card. Basically, it's something to... Usually powerful cards have some sort of a drawback, and sometimes they are paying something or doing something during your maintenance phase. Magic calls this phase the upkeep phase. Yu-Gi-Oh! calls it the standby phase. Now during your main phase, this is where most of the action is going to take place with players playing your cards, creatures, events, items, locations, whatever it may be. If you don't have a resource system, like we talked a little bit earlier and I said limiting the number of cards that someone can play, can players play anything they want or is there some sort of limit or a restriction for them to actually play those cards? Magic Force of Will, you had to use your resources in order to do that. As long as you have the resources, you play any cards you want. In uh, the Redemption trading card game, you could play anything you wanted without real restriction. Uh, however, there are some cards that only work with certain colors, or, the, or as they call them in that game, brigades. So this particular enhancement can only be used on gold, or whatever it may be, or um, the silver brigade, whatever it may be. An older version of Gundam War, in the Japanese version, now they did have one in the U.S. for a, a very limited time period. I was overseas, so I didn't get to actually purchase it or anything like that, but you could only play uh, one unit card one generation card and one character per turn as long as you had um, as long as you had resources when I talk about resources there was these generation cards didn't actually tap it says this is the amount that limited the kinds of cards you could play all of the units and everything like that had you had to have this number of generation cards in play didn't have to tap them just had to have them in play that being said, Gundam War also had an additional cost of you would discard cards from the top of your deck based on this you know, scrap cost that uh, units and all these other cards may have had, which also doubled, uh, made this doubly dangerous is that Gundam War was a deck out game. So, uh, during your, uh, so other things to do is that... Um, most games have a main phase that comes before the combat phase. Now, some recent games, what you do is you have your like draw, and then your maintenance, and your, ma and your main phase, and you have an attack phase, and then that's it. You go right to your end phase, finish up, and then your turn's over. A couple of different games do have two main phases, one that occurs both before and after combat. Consider if you want to have these particular two phases or just one two phases allow people to say okay during their first main phase they can play all these particular cards that they want then they can attack and then if the attack uh, sort of failed or didn't go the way that they thought during their second main phase they can somehow recoup or play some different cards some other cards that will allow them to basically uh, prevent it from being a total loss now, for your combat system, how is combat actually handled? Do you have a separate phase for one, or do they just attack during the main phase? Another thing to consider is that do all creatures attack at once, or do they attack one at a time? Honestly, the current TCG environment is that uh, characters or creatures attack one at a time. Match of the Gathering, of course, is an all or nothing. You have to declare all of your attacks at once, and then they're all handled at a particular time. But you also have to consider what do I want to attack with, and what do I want to block with, if you want to do that whatsoever. Now, 
Now, do players have to attack another creature if possible? For example, Yu-Gi-Oh! If your opponent has a creature, basic rules is that you have to attack that creature. You have to get rid of their creatures before you can hit your opponent directly. Yeah, there are exceptions to that rule, but basically that's how it's handled. Now, do they attack creatures, and then once they're all gone, you get to attack your opponent directly? Or do creatures attack your opponent, and then they decide if they're going to block or defend with some other creature? <clears throat> so, how do you determine the winner and loser of creature combat? Magic the Gathering has power and toughness for its creatures, and, you know... When a creature receives damage equal to or greater than its toughness, then it's destroyed. Now this damage can be done in combat, but also other card effects can actually do damage to those creatures. And damage that a creature has uh, taken is accumulated uh, throughout the entire turn. So what will happen is that, let's say, uh, <clears throat> let's say you attack with a creature and your opponent blocks with a big creature and you do a lot of damage to it, but you don't destroy that creature. If you had a card in your hand afterwards that could do some additional damage, you could conceivably play that to destroy that big creature. Now, Force of Will is similar in this particular vein. Now, Dual Masters simply had creatures compare their power. Basically, the one with the bigger number one. And then the loser was destroyed. And if both the numbers are equal, both of them were destroyed. Final Fantasy, uh, a bit similar to Magic the Gathering, instead of having power and toughness, just has something called power. And what they do is it deals damage equal to its power, but that's also the amount of damage it can take. And just like Magic the Gathering, the damage is, is uh, accrued throughout the turn, but then it's healed at the end of the turn, just like Magic the Gathering. So, let's say this is in creature combat. What happens when a creature hits your opponent? If you're using a life system, how much damage are they going to be actually doing? We'll talk about that in a slide here. But if you're using a shield system, can a creature somehow destroy more than one shield? Dual Masters, there's Double Breaker, Triple Breaker, Quadruple Breaker, World Breaker, and all sorts of stuff like that. That normally a creature would only destroy one shield, but with a special ability they could destroy two, three, or all of them. Now... <clears throat> talked about how if a creature hits your opponent you do damage equal to its power or is there some other statistic that you would like to put on the card like buddy fight had a critical value has a critical value to know how much damage you actually do to your opponent as two sets of values just for creature combat themselves to determine the winner and loser but if it should hit your opponent it has this other value that's the amount of damage that could be done for example buddy fight you have 10 10 life at the beginning of the game, as you can see, one of the bigger creatures here does three points of damage if it gets through. Zombie World Order was kind of the same. You had uh, 10 life and um, had a critical value as well. So the larger number there, the seven, was the amount of damage it could do and receive in creature combat. But the two was the amount of damage it could do to an opponent when it hit them directly. Then at the end of your turn, you're gonna have the end phase. And during this phase, players are going to clean up whatever cards, whatever effects that are happening, things end, temporary effects, all of that. This is usually also paired with some sort of a hand limit. How many cards can a player keep in their hand at the end of the turn before they have to discard? Or do you even have a limit? As I recall, Pokemon used to not have a hand limit. Uh, I think that's still the case. But uh, most games have a hand limit equal to the number of cards you start the game with plus one sometimes but some of them was just related to the hand size that you started the game with magic the gathering hand size is seven the same number of cards you started the game with if you had eight or more cards in your hand at the end of your turn you had to discard until you had seven you go the hand size is six at the end of the turn which is the number of cards you start the game with plus one if you have seven or more cards in your hand you have to discard until you have six we talked a lot about the rules here, and hopefully a lot of it wasn't too out and left field. Hopefully it did give you some um, food for thought and what kind of rules that you're going to be using. We're talking about basic rules here. So when you move on from pretty much what you'd like to decide in your rule set, then you can move on to the card design. Um, 
think of a couple of different things when you're designing your particular cards. Card types, any types of factions, special ability or multiple abilities, your combat statistics, and of course the cost if you're using some sort of resource system. So what kind of card types are you going to include? This is not just, this isn't related to the factions, but the kinds of cards that you can actually play, like creatures, um, events that can be only played during your turn, uh, events that can be played out of turn, you know, items, things that simply exist, but some that need to be attached to another creature, and even some locations that you may have. You know, some games include something called a partner card. You start the game with you start it off to the side here and uh, it's not usually included as part of your deck but it gives you some sort of additional ability states what your faction is and um, is always available usually to you as the player like Legend of the Five Rings had something called stronghold cards which basically stated what your faction was it sort of affected your deck building but it gave you starting honor value remember how we talked about that honor life point system earlier on it gave you a starting value, uh, but um, it also stated how strong your provinces were, how much damn, basically how much power it took to destroy them, but it also gave you some resource generation at the start of the game. Legend of the Five Rings did have resource generator, generators that you paid for that you would use in later turns to play, uh, pay for more cards, but this gave you a starting option to be able to play certain cards. Um, Magic introduced a card type. Uh, it's only used in you know special formats it's called Vanguard. It uh, gave you a special ability, but it also affected your starting hand and starting life sizes. And then Magic also has a format called Commander, which allows you to use a creature, any kind of creature. It doesn't need to be a special one. Uh, that it affected how you built your deck, but also you could play that card. Um, from what is called the command zone. It was always available, so as soon as you had the resources to play it, if you wanted to play it, you could play it right from there. And if it got destroyed or returned to the head, it went back to that commander zone. Now, Arjun Saga has two partners. One is called a champion, one's called a spirit. And you weren't limited to just the same. I use the word color. You could use one champion, a completely different colored spirit. Now, if you had the same color, um, it, those are the only cards that you could actually include in your deck. In other words, that particular color. Here we have two dark um, based cards. If your spirit and your champion were both dark, you'd only include dark and neutral cards in your deck. But if your spirit was a different color, there's a number in the upper left and that tells you how many of that spirit's color worth of cards do you put in your deck. So this one, let's just say this, um, spirit card was actually blue as an eight you could include most of your deck must be dark cards or neutral cards but the spirit allowed you to include eight blue up to eight blue cards in your deck now force of will has something called ruler cards starts the game next to your deck kind of thing like that it gave you special abilities but also it could be flipped over to turn into a creature that you could use during the game so you weren't, you know, SOL if you couldn't have a, a creature out. The World of Warcraft had something called hero cards, which gave you special abilities, but also controlled your starting life and technically represented you, the player, kind of like most partner cards do. But it could also be flipped over just like the Force of Will ruler cards to give you some sort of other ability. Some had just like a simple one here. Some had certain abilities on one side, none on the other and vice versa. Chaos Galaxy, of course, has a planet card which affects creatures of that planet in a positive way. You include creatures of whatever um, planet that you wanted, but chiefly your planet card gave a bonus to creatures from that planet. Of course, Wrath of Cores, um, you have a core card um, which determines your starting life value or hit points, but also gave you one or more special abilities. Not only that, it also gave you resource generation at the beginning of the game so you weren't always out of luck now we talk about factions now we're not talking about card types here we're talking about this is if you're familiar with magic the gathering force will you get whatever it may be these are the color types or elemental types that they have factions allow you to separate your resource types but also 
factions give you a separation of what um, factions can do things better than others. It doesn't mean that uh, this faction can't do the same thing as another thing, but generally your faction should concentrate on more uh, its, its specialty and include fewer cards of things that are not its specialty. For example, red usually does direct damage. Uh, blue draws cards, green has big creatures, black is self-destructive, white has defensive and healing options. Magic the Gathering, of course, it has, um, for those colors, those are basically its chief specialties, but it does include abilities to do things from other colors, but not in the amount of its specialty. Now, when it comes to special abilities, what kinds of abilities do cards have? Now, basically, what's going to set them apart? There are even groups of cards against other cards that you have created. You know, try to have some consistency about, you know, what those abilities do and what those factions can do. So keep in mind that uh, you might want to include some keywords abilities, and we'll discuss those a little later on. Now, don't forget your combat statistics. Now you can determine how well the creature does in combat. Is it weak, moderate, or is it beefy? Is it really, really weak, um, so it's cheaper to play, or is it really, really strong, and has a, and is very hard to take down in combat? Is it very offensive, but very weak, and then it can't take a lot of damage? Or is it very defensive, but and, and it can't do a lot of damage? It doesn't protect or does use it mainly you know, in a rush attack kind of thing like that. Those are some items to keep in mind when you're designing the combat statistics of your cards. Now we get something called cost. Now the cost of the card is the most arbitrary item that you have to decide on. Now what you want to do is you want to keep in mind both the combat statistics and special abilities that the card has. Generally, the more useful a card is, the more it should cost. And what I'd like to do is that uh, um, perhaps uh, I'd like take costs and do an additional video video on that, basically on card balance. But what I'm going to do is just keep in mind that you want to balance the cost based on how well it does in combat, but also the, the strength of its abilities. Now, now when you're creating your cards, keep in mind. I'd include one or more cards to do a lot of the things of the following. You know, drawing cards, discarding cards, in other words, if your opponent can discard cards, or if that's a valid deck type. I know not a lot of people like discard strategies. I personally don't, but that could be a valid strategy in your own game. Um, how about reducing and increasing combat statistics? How about destroying creatures outright? Instead of just damage, but just outright, either just destroy one creature or do like a massive board wipe. Now how about destroying other different cards and play other than creatures? You know, destroying one, destroying multiple ones or the entire board. How about something that revives creatures? How about cards that generate resources? Now, if you have a resource system um, and you're creating cards that generate resources, be very, very careful that you do not create cards or many of them that produce more resources than it takes to play them if you're familiar with magic the gathering um they have a series of cards called the power nine and um six of those cards are resource producers and they cost nothing to play one of them basically you basically put it into play and pitch it. it's called the black lotus you've probably heard of it but if you haven't it is the most expensive card in Magic the Gathering, mainly because if the card was available in the current market, everyone would include the maximum number of them that they could in their deck, every deck at any given time. Because you play it, then you basically discard it from play and you get three free resources. The other ones are based on each of the five colors. They're called Moxes and it costs nothing to play them and you tap them and you get a free resource. Be careful with doing that because it can lead to very, very degenerate combos and an overwhelming advantage to the players that play those cards. That's why those, uh, the Black Lotus and those Moxes are restricted or even banned in various card uh, formats. Now, how about some cards to prevent damage that 
you as a player have taken, or perhaps something that creatures have taken. How about recovering cards from the discard pile? So return, return a creature from the discard pile to your hand, or whatever it may be. How about searching for cards in your deck? How about readying cards? In other words, if a card's exhausted, something to ready it. That way it can be used again or might be able to block. How about exhausting cards? That way it um, prevents that particular creature from blocking or you can ignore it when you're trying to attack. If you're going to be having alternate win conditions, make sure that you don't forget to put cards for those alternate win conditions. I know it seems to be like, well, that's obvious, Ed, but... What you want to do is don't forget to do that. How about cards that stop other cards from being played? Um, Magic the Gathering has counter spells, just like any other game may have it as well. When you have those cards can be played out of turn. This prevents players from um, using a card that is far too powerful. How about dealing damage to creatures and or your opponent? Much of that card just do damage to creatures and that's it. Maybe it's just to your opponent. Maybe it's both. Don't know. It's up to you. How about gaining life or points? It's a valid strategy. Players have lost life. They wouldn't be able to recover it. Or if you have a point-based system, maybe you give them that particular edge by a card that allows them to get one or two points. Now, well, here's some keyword abilities. Basically, a keyword ability is a shortened version of a rule. So instead of writing out a long description on the card, you can include just this one particular word. Imagine the Gathering uh, used to not have reminder text, but some cards do still have them. It's just that in your game, this basically, if anything, it is for you to be able to get more text onto your card. Something like Death Touch. If a creature just destroy, uh, the creature destroys any creature, it deals damage to. First Strike, it's in multiple games. The creature deals its combat damage to a creature it is fighting first. A lot of games, creatures do damage to each other at the same time. First Strike says, I do my damage first. So if your creature dies, then it doesn't get to destroy my creature. Flashback. Magic the Gathering, you can play this card from your discard pile by playing a certain cost. Doesn't have to be resources, it can be other cards, like discarding cards, whatever it may be. Flying, also in multiple games. And the creature can't be blocked by creatures that don't have fly. Haste and Magic the Gathering. The creature can attack the turn it has played. Some games have a rule where creatures cannot attack that, or use abilities that exhaust themselves the turn that they're played. Magic the Gathering causes summoning sickness. So does Dual Masters. So, if that's a rule in your game, is there something in your game that allows them to override that rule? Once again, like I said, cards are made to break the rules of the game. How about Hexproof? Magic the Gathering. This card can't be chosen as a target of card effects. Um, um, basically by your opponent. This, there's another one called Shroud where it can't be targeted whether by you or your opponent. Hexproof prevents your opponent from targeting with cards, but mass kill cards could take care of that. Now, how about Indestructible? Um, the card can't be destroyed. Be careful of that because... Um, it can lead to certain cards. Once again, if they're indestructible, your opponent generally can't get rid of them unless they use some sort of different card strategy. So, if you're going to be including cards in your game which destroy stuff, try some other cards as well that don't destroy but return cards to opponent's hand. Or maybe move some game, something of that nature to get around cards that can't be destroyed. There's a rule called Legendary Magic the Gathering. You can only uh, one copy of that card can be in play between all players. Some games have a similar mechanic, but each player is allowed to have a copy in play. So it's whoever gets their card in first, the other players can't play them. How about Pierce? You know, in uh, Buddy Fight Transformers, the creature always does some damage when it attacks another creature. Um, how about uh, Protection from Something Magic the Gathering? This card can't be chosen as the target of a specific type of card effect. Sometimes, or can't be blocked by those creatures, it can't be dealt damage from those kinds of cards. So something as protection from red, uh, red cards can't target it, it can't be blocked by red creatures, and ignores all damage from red cards. It doesn't necessarily have to be the faction, sometimes protection from a card type. There is one card in, uh, it's a Hydra, it's called Progenitus, which 
the card effect is literally protection from everything. That's what's written in the card. Go look it up. You'll probably go and you'll probably laugh. And a matter of fact, you know what? Pause the video. Go look for a scan of that card. And take a look at it by yourself. <clears throat> so, trample. Uh, multiple games. When this card attacks and destroys a blocking creature, it deals damage over the blocking creature's toughness, if there was any. So, let's say I had a creature with 7 power, and you had a creature with 1 toughness, and I attacked and you blocked with it. Well, 1 damage would be absorbed by the creature, and the remaining 6 would be done to you. Now, card suggestions. You probably have an idea of a number of the different cards that you want to create something interesting. Uh, that being said, don't be afraid to look at other card games for inspiration about the kinds of cards you want to create. Maybe you look through Magic the Gathering sets or Yu-Gi-Oh sets, uh, anything like that. That being said, also, don't just directly copy a card from another game. I mean, use it as a base and create your own spin on it because it, of course it also depends on your rules. Like, for example, if your game system is completely different than Magic the Gathering, a direct copying of a Magic the Gathering card is not going to be possible. But if you like the effect on a certain card, don't be afraid to include it. Now, we talk about your story and there, there, there are two main reasons why I talk about your story. Uh, one that the TCG you're creating is your story. In other words, it is your game. You're creating it the way you want. You're going to create your own characters and events and things like that. That being said, if you're sort of stuck about what to do, about what to call cards, anything of that nature, I highly consider you creating your own backstory to your own world. In various places, this is called world building. Basically, how does your world operate? What's the big plot line? Uh, well, who's the big baddie? What are some literal events that have happened in that particular world of yours? And this can give you inspiration about what kinds of cards to create and also what to call your cards. It gives you additional lore and perhaps even flavor text for your cards as well. Let's just use an example. Star Wars, Lord of the Rings. Um, they're licensed properties, but they have dozens upon dozens of years of backstory that whoever's creating any product based on those licenses, whether it be card game, board game, whatever it is, they have a lot of material that they can create from. Now, another one is Redemption. Uses people, events, and relics from the Bible, of all things, when there's a lot of information in there. So, if you want to create more cards or give your world a little more depth, then what you want to do is that try and create a backstory. See what happens. See how much luck you have with it. Now, card templates. This is another subject uh, that I would probably like to create another video on, but I want to include a little information here. Uh, your card template is going to be the thing that people will be looking at just about all the time. Let's try to create something that is basic yet enough that you're going to be able to contain all the information you need for the card, you know, along with its name and picture and um, cost and illustrator and all of that. You know, some creators use Photoshop to do all their work for their art and everything like that. That being said, uh, Photoshop is expensive. I think there might be a student version that you can get for a nominal fee, but there's another program called the GIMP, which sort of emulates what Photoshop could do, but it's also 100% free. And that's the one that I use for what I'm currently doing for my own homemade trading card game, but also the other aforementioned card game I talked about a long while ago. Now, if you really can't come up with a template uh, for any cards, you know, the Game Crafter and some other uh, resource sites uh, have usually have a section where you can purchase card templates for a nominal fee and then you can use them within your own game. Now, card art. This is the one that takes the most time and a lot of times is a barrier to a lot of designers creating their own homemade TCG. In the homemade TCG community, creators tend to do everything. Templates, rules, and their own art. Depending on your art style, this can be a plus or a minus. If you don't have a very good art style, if you don't have any faith in your own art style, then, this, once again, it can be a barrier. That being said, your own art style gives the game its own individuality. 
Don't be afraid to create your own art, whatever it may be. If you happen to have the money, eh, insert your laugh there, you can get art from sites like DriveThroughRPG.com or DeviantArt. DriveThroughRPG.com, no, I'm not sponsored by them or anything like that. They do actually have a resources section where you can get either single pieces of art or bundles that you can include uh, as part of your game, usually royalty free. Be careful on some of those packages of art because I recall seeing one or two designers that you can use them in your commercial projects but only so many copies of a commercial product. So what you want to do is you want to read that sort of royalty free license or how you may use them very carefully before you start to use that kind of art in your game. You can also do search the public domain art that you include in your game. But make sure that you give credit where credit is due. I can't hammer that hard in hard enough. Make sure that you give credit where credit is due when you're using art, especially, you know, ones that you purchase, things of that nature. <clears throat> now, talk about card rarities. Uh, for the most part, up until Pokemon, the TCG generally had three main rarities. that uncommon, uncommon, and rare. You got one rare pack, a couple uncommons, and the rest are going to be commons. Technically, you could add that some games had starter deck exclusive cards, but, you know, for most part, you could c consider those to be common. Now, for the non-Japanese of Pokemon, um, they also had non-foil versions of foil rares. In Japan, you only had foils for uh, those various cards. <clears throat> However, I should add that some earlier games had something called a chase card that were rarer than a rare card. There would be nowadays you would refer to those as a super rare. <clears throat> Magic the Gathering continued that um, common uncommon rare pattern until 1999 when they introduced foil cards. And for Magic the Gathering, a foil card is not a separate rarity so to speak. Rather, what it is that there's a foil version of a card that already existed in the set. So it's almost like a parallel set of cards. Um, and then what they did was they uh, inserted the mythic rare level of rarity in 2008. And you could consider that to be Magic the Gathering super rare card because it's only in so many packs. Now Yu-Gi-Oh! of course has to have the most card rarity types hands down you know they've won they've won the battle on that common rare super rare ultra rare secret rare ultimate rare each being more difficult to get than the last there are far more of them but you know what i'm not going to go into it here because that's a little too far into the weeds for this video here okay i'm going to talk to you yes you watch this video right now if you're creating your own trading card game you are going to create cards that are too powerful or cards that you introduce in a later set are going to be found to be too powerful when combined with cards in an earlier set. It's a fact of life. Your players, especially if they like to play your game, are going to do what they can to find a way to break the cards that you have. If possible, they will attempt to find an infinite loop to be able to win the game in one turn. It happens in Yu-Gi-Oh! and some other card games as well. It's called One Turn Kills. It's going to happen unless you put a lot of time and thought into the cards that you're actually creating even when you do that it's still going to happen i'll give you a perfect example uh for when the sailor moon trading card game came out many 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 years ago what 20 years ago um i bought into it i played it for a while and um when the game came out i started testing a couple of different deck types based on the cards that i had and three days after the game release, I found a infinite loop. I could win the game on my second turn. That's what players do. They're going to attempt to find cards that are too powerful and abuse them as much as possible. I'll give you a question here. Take a look at the card on the screen right now. This is a card from um, Dual Masters, Kaijudo. Um... Take a look at it, and I'll go over what it is. Here. Now the name is Bombazar, Dragon of Destiny. That's his name. Armor Dragon, Earth Dragon, is uh, technically its um, keyword faction. But this card, color-wise, it's red and green. And um, just to give you a little basis, Dual Masters is basically Magic the Gathering Light. 
has a shield system and basically functions like Magic the Gathering with a few tweaks and changes here and there. Now, uh, down there in the text box here, it says the this creature is put into your mana zone tapped. So like I said with uh, Dual Masters, you can use any card from your hand and you can put it down in your mana zone to provide mana of whatever color it is. Usually multi multicolored cards put in tapped because that was the drawback to having something that could provide multiple resource types for your deck. Now its next effect is when you put this creature into the battle zone, destroy all of the creatures that have 6,000 power. This prevents you from playing multiples of this particular creature. But the next part is take an extra turn after this one. You lose the game at the end of that turn. Next effect is a speed attacker. This creature doesn't uh, doesn't get summoning sickness. This is the equivalent of haste in Magic the Gathering, where it can attack the turn it's played. And the last thing is double breaker. This creature breaks two shields. Once again, it's a shield-based game. You have five shields, break them all, attack your opponent one more time, and then you win. It also has 6,000 power. It's not a very powerful card based on combat statistics alone. Um, but what I want you to do is take a look at this card for, again. I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. How strong is this card? Once again, we're going to be doing some balance type of stuff and, and perhaps another video. Um, but I want you to take a look at just this card based on a deck that is created around it how strong is this card? I want to give you the answer here. The card is so strong that it almost destroyed the Dual Masters trading card game in Japan. Those who play the Japanese version of Dual Masters, since it's not available in the US anymore, know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there was a basically a three-color deck that um, abused the ability to get this card into play, take an extra turn, and basically finish off your opponents. As I recall from reading the Dual Masters Wikia uh, and uh, some qualifiers in one region, all of the top decks, all 16 top decks, were variations of this deck type. You get that? All of the top decks were running this card and a deck based around it. Basically, if you were not using that deck and you weren't using some sort of rush beat down bounce deck, you were not going to win. You just weren't. When I say it, it almost destroyed the Dual Masters car trading card game. It is a 100% unequivocal fact. What I do is uh, uh, there is a channel on YouTube called Card Kingdom, and this is not Card Kingdom in the U.S. There is a franchise of uh, trading card game stores in Japan called Card Kingdom. And they run a number of videos. A lot of times they have Yu-Gi-Oh! in it. They have Dual Masters. They have Weiss Schwartz, uh, Buddy Fight, and all of that. Uh, the gentleman who actually started the franchise, um, he actually created Buddy Fight. It's a nice channel. You might want to go view it. If you want to know about it, I can put it in uh, the description of the video here. He actually did a video on this particular card. What he was doing, since he was involved a lot in uh, the IP of Buddy Fight, he sort of was uh, not in many of the videos. So they talked about some memories they had about the Duel Masters card game. And one of them was, I'll go back here, this card. Basically, it became... Uh, not so much dual master. Some people would basically, if you transliterate, transliterated it, the game was not called dual masters. It was called Bomba masters because all the decks were playing this particular card. And he went on to say that, um, the very first day that, uh, the card came out, some of the high level players who knew what was going on, brought it to the attention. Hey, look, what you got to do is you, you got to ban this card here, at least in the shop, or you got to talk to the, the manufacturer, you know, the company, you know, um, Hobby Japan. You say, do something about this card. Because um, what it was is that one of the regular players to um, this gentleman's store was uh, normally a shut in. He's, uh, if you know the Japanese term, hikikomori, 
which is uh, he didn't go to school. Um, we don't know the <clears throat> the background of this particular uh, kid or anything like that, but he would show up at the store. He was actually rather popular at the store. He exclusively played dual masters, used his money on his allowance, whatever it may be. <clears throat> he made a lot of friends that way. Uh, when Bombazar or a uh, Bol Bol Zar, I believe it was called in the Japanese version, since uh, um, I'm just running off the top of my head here. Uh, once that game came, once that card came out, um, the owner of the store saw dozens of kids quit the game on the spot. So, let's just talk about this kid who used to be a shut-in. Well, what happens is that um, when kids quit the game, then basically he's losing his friends. So um, talk about how well you know he was a, he was a rather you know you know straight laced kid, and the and the manager of the store mentioned that hey look you know what just hey we'll lend you some decks for any for any games that we're playing just you know come on and play and he says well you know what uh, you know I don't. I don't feel so right about coming and not buying anything. And eventually he, um, he stopped coming and they didn't know what happened to him or anything like that. Granted, um, this is a worst case scenario based on this one card that was released. It actually took them about six months to ban the card. And it was actually one of the driving forces in creating the ban list in the first place. It is 100% banned. You can't play it. When it was released in the U.S., it was put on Wizards of the Coast watch list. But the fact of the matter is Dual Masters was far more popular in Japan than it was in the U.S. So um, nothing was really done about it. And by the time that it could become popular well the game had folded so it's not officially restricted or banned if you decide to use any old english cards odds are this is not going to happen to your game i mean creating something very very powerful things like that i mean homemade tcgs don't have a large market but what i want you to do is keep the story in mind how one card could actually destroy a very very popular card game so when those cards come out not if when how are you going to handle it how are you going to handle that card or combination of cards that get too powerful and usually the most um Usual correction is that the company creates a banned and or restricted list to limit the number of cards someone can put in a deck. Heck, even a homemade TCG like Chaos Galaxy has its um, its limited list or banned and semi-banned list, I believe he calls it. Now, creation of that particular banned or restricted list is to give players a better experience experience by preventing the game from devolving into players only using a few select cards and having one deck type dominate the environment like i said about that bomb bazaar everyone was all the high level players were just playing that deck and you don't want that to happen to your game the pro is that it limits the game from de degenerating into using only certain cards but of course the con is that players can't use their full card pool banning should be your last resort you know, restrict it as much as possible. Um, but there are two schools of thought. If you're going to ban a card, why create it in the first place? Well, they're human and they don't know what how powerful a card is going to be. Um, one of the restricted cards in Magic the Gathering is something called Ancestral Recall. For one resource, you get to draw three cards. And nowadays, yes, that is entirely too powerful. Most of the time now you have to pay three to draw two. But you have to understand where Magic the Gathering was originally created and where it came from. No one could have anticipated how big Magic the Gathering got. So cards that seemed to be innocuous at first uh, turned out to be very, very powerful when the competitive scene was actually developed. And that's why a number of cards are banned restricted and usually what they do is that they play test this stuff now the different schools of thought on creating power levels in different sets and of course that's that's a, a topic that is far beyond what i'd like to go in here but be careful with the power levels of the cards that you're doing and if something becomes too powerful how are you going to deal with it 
Okay. Um, do you have something called a mulligan rule? If players aren't really familiar with that. It's basically a second chance. It, you, it comes from golf, mainly. And um, in trading card games, it allows you somehow redo your opening hand. If you're unsatisfied with your opening hand, you can somehow exchange it out. Originally, Magic the Gathering had the rule that, hey, if you, in your opening hand of seven cards, if you didn't have any lands, what you got to do is you got to put your, shuffle your hand back into your deck, draw seven new cards. You only got one chance. Then it evolved into what you do is that in your initial hand, seven cards. If you don't like your hand for whatever the reason, you shuffle it into your deck and then draw uh, a new starting hand minus one card for each time you mulligan. So in other words, starting hand of seven cards. If you said, I'm taking a mulligan, shuffle it in, you only draw six. If you, and you can repeat that as many times as you want. You can go down to like a two hand starting, two card starting hand if you wanted. Then now what they do is they have something, um, the new mulligan rule is, um, as I recall, is you draw your seven cards and then what you do is that if you're not happy with it, you can shuffle it back into your deck and draw a new hand. You can repeat that as many times as you want, but when you have settled on your starting hand, then what you do is you take a number of cards from your starting hand equal to the number of times you mulliganed and put them back at the bottom of your deck. Um, so consider allowing players to do something similar. Some of their games just say, hey, you know, what you do is that you can take X number of cards from your starting hand, put it at the bottom of your deck, and draw cards to replace it. Um, the new rule for uh, Wrath of Chorus basically is what you do is that you draw 10 cards in your starting hand, and then you take three cards from your hand and put them at the bottom of your deck in the order of your choice. Because the one thing you want to do is that you, uh, you're fighting against a lot of luck in a trading card game. And you want to minimize luck as much as possible. So by giving players a fighting chance, by using some sort of mulligan, it can lead to an overall better experience for them. You know, how many times have you played a trading card game? Draw your starting hand, and you're like, oh, I'm not winning this game. Just consider something like that. So mainly, that's what I have had to offer in this particular video. If you've listened to the end here or watched until the end, I hope that it's been worth your time. I don't know how long the video has actually been going on here. When I edit it, I'll have to find it out. Um, but if you like this video, you know, leave a comment um, down there. Give it a, a thumbs up, something like that. because That way I can find out if people actually like this kind of content. If people like the video here, uh, there are a couple other ones that I'd like to do. I've got a couple of topics up here that I can think of at first here, card templates. Of course, I've talked about card balance. You know, some interesting card effects from overall from certain games. And what I'll do is that maybe I'll go over some not only English related game, but some Japanese related games, some interesting rules and mechanics, the way that they turn out. But you know what, if you have any other topics, that perhaps you'd like me to cover or give an opinion on or get some, just get some more info on it, put it down in the comments. Um, let me know um, what you'd like to see in the future. So what I do is I've kept you quite a bit of a while here. I look forward to what you have to say about it. We'll see you in the next video. Take care, everyone.